A public defender might be good because he'll kind of just give you a better deal than you would be had no lawyer at all. But if you really like, you really need to win the case. I know like I think some medical professionals, if they get a DUI, they get their license. That's the time you need to get a lawyer who's going to fight this thing tooth and nail. You know, you ran a DUI, the offer is going to be pretty standard, but most people don't know that. There's some lawyers who love that because they show up the first day of the thing, they get their offer, they call it a day. Like, I'm not going to charge you my full DUI fee if I'm going to plead out the first day. Like, I might go with you the morning of, we don't settle it that morning, then you're going to pay me the rest of my fee. We're going to figure it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Nas Truth Podcast. And today we have Ibrahim Mahtaseb, who is one of my best friends and somebody who is a DUI specialist and has represented hundreds of people on both sides of the fence. He's prosecuted working for the DA, and he's also defended people now working as a criminal defense attorney. Uh, Ibrahim has a lot of extensive skill within this field, and he's going to really break down what it means when you get a DUI, all of the costs that are involved, all of the headache that's involved, potential jail time, and all of the things that you might have to deal with when dealing with a DUI. This is great if you also obviously have never gotten a DUI, but if you just want to understand what a loved one is going through when they get a DUI. It's a very difficult time in their lives, and a lot of people don't understand the consequences and the repercussions of getting a DUI. So please tune in if you're interested. We have a lot of great information that we're going to be sharing with you guys today. Let's get going. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nasty Truth Podcast. Today, we have one of my best friends. We have Ibrahim Muhtaseb on the show. Ibrahim Muhtaseb, let me give you a little bit of background, but also first, thank you so much for being here today. We really appreciate it. Of course, Joe, you're my best friend, so yeah. anything for you. <laughs> of course, thank you, sir. So Ibrahim, for all of you that don't know him, Ibrahim was a criminal law specialist, somebody who specialized in DUI types of cases. He worked for the district attorney. He's now working for the other side, which I like to call the Darth side. He's working as a defense personal injury attorney, and he has experience in multiple REMs from criminal law all the way through personal injury law. And today we're going to be bringing him in here to pick his brain. Uh, Ibrahim is also an MMA fighter. He lived in Brazil for a couple years, uh, training jiu-jitsu. And on top of that, he's a bodybuilder, and he comes from a wide steed of individuals. He has five brothers. Four, three brothers. Four, three, three brothers. brothers. Well, they're all, they're all over six feet tall. They're all <laughs> tall and as handsome as he, are, as he is. And I'm really excited to have him here. So, Ibrahim, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Of course. Really appreciate it. So, Ibrahim, we wanted to talk about specifically today, you know, let's talk about your experience with the DA. So, sure. who is the DA and what does the DA do? So, the DA is, um, typically they work for the county, like Orange County has their di di district attorney. Like, even certain, like, even Anaheim has their own state prosecutors, but you pretty much are an attorney who prosecute, prosecutes criminal violations for a county, right? So, LA has their DA, Orange County has their DA. I work for the Orange County District Attorney's Office during law school. Okay. And what they do is they pretty much, not pretty much, they essentially prosecute crit criminal cases on behalf of the, the people. So they work generally for the public, for the public good. Got it. What type of individuals are district attorneys? Did you get to know yours very well, or were you working below in, in different deputies? Yeah, no, I mean, the, the big DA, the guy, the DA, when you're in the lower levels, you don't get to meet him. And I'm, I, you, once you get to the top level, like when you're like assistant deputy district attorney, that's when you kind of have more interaction with him. But um, for me, I dealt with more of the lower level DAs, and so... If you're looking for any specific type, like if you're trying to kind of type them out, they're they're kind of the way I describe D DAs is is they're kind of like the Boy Scouts of the legal world, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like um, the goody two shoes. Yeah, right? they they everyone's always guilty. It's very extreme, no matter what. Like they're doing the good work, and it's fine, right? But like there's there what I didn't like it about the DA's office was there was a lack of like human element there. It was just you got to prosecute this case. We don't care if there's an excuse. It was very just get this done. This person's guilty, and it wasn't. It was more like let's get this file off my desk so I can get on the next one. Got it. I mean, how many cases do they usually put on your desk at a time? Every morning was about a hundred because I would show up to the misdemeanor arraignment court, and we would just try and plead things out every morning. Yeah. Got it. So let's let's give um, the guests a little bit of an understanding. So let's say that somebody's arrested for some sort of crime. Okay, and then they get. They get booked, they go to jail. Let's give them a little bit of an idea of like what the general legal process is just so that they have an idea of what the basic steps are. And then we're going to get more focused in on DUIs. But let's give them the basic process of what happens after they get arrested and they get a court date. Okay, so you're, you, the person gets arrested, right? Um, what will happen is the cop will either detain them 
and the, or the cop will let him, the officer will let him go. If the officer lets him go, typically, almost every time, they'll say, okay, well, you have a court date here, right? And they'll say, you have to show up to court on this day. And so you show up to court on that day. But, and then if you don't, there are warrants issued out for your arrest. But if they take you into detention, they have to either allow you to post bail or they have to put you in front of a judge within 72 hours. Okay, so let's talk about that first day when you go in. So yeah. when you go in on that first day, what is that first day about? Like, what are you going to be talking about with the judge? What is the uh, criminal or the person who's committed the crime going to be discussing? Is, do they get their future court dates, or is it just like an initial part deciding what they're going to do with that? Sure. So uh, the initial, the first court date is called your arraignment. So essentially what you do is you go in there, and you either plead guilty or not guilty, right? If it's guilty... Case is done, you figure out your punishment, you call it a day, which happens sometimes, right? Or you say not guilty, then you come back and you do, do what are called pretrial, pretrial negotiations. Some people call them, you know, uh, misdemeanor settlement conferences or f felony settlement conferences. It just depends on the level of whatever you're charged with. But essentially, you come back the next day after the DA gives your, your attorney or you evidence, you review it and you say, okay, well, do we want to do we want to figure out something here, like a, like a criminal settlement is what I kind of typically call them, or are we going to trial on this one? We're going to take this to trial, and that's kind of the first day you get arraigned. Then you figure out what you're going to do. You're either going to set it for a, a pre-trial negotiation, or you're going to set it for trial. Got it. And would you recommend like I know some people go without an attorney to that first meeting, but sure. do you always recommend that somebody goes with an attorney, or do you think they can handle it on their own? Um, oh, that's a tricky question. So I. Probably I typically, on the level yeah, of, like crime, right? Even with DUIs, I suggest like getting a lawyer who will just be on call for the morning of because you know you ran a DUI, right? You like it's pretty standard. You got a DUI, the offer is going to be pretty standard, but most people don't know that, right? So there's some lawyers who love that because they show up the first day of the day, they get their offer, they call it a day, right? I want the mind where I'm like, I'm not going to charge you my full DUI fee if I'm gonna plead out the first day. I know that's bad business for me, right? Yeah. Because a typical DUI is you know, 2,500 to four grand for a first time DUI, right? I'll be like, all right, well just call me, like I might go with you the morning of at 750. If we don't settle it that morning, then you're gonna pay me the rest of my fee. We're gonna figure this out. Got it, okay. So it becomes a more of a monetary issue, but then also you have the public defender who's available too. So if you don't have money, you always have the option of going to the public defender and they're pretty good with kind of telling you what to do or not to do. Understood. I've heard actually really bad things about public defenders, right? Because they don't actually have a bone in the fight with the client. Sure. So they just like, just like the DA, they almost want to get you in and they want to get you off their desk, yeah. right? Would that be a general understanding? So for like lower level crimes, I don't, I don't think a, a PD would be harmful, like a DUI. They kind of know what they're doing. You're not going to need, it well, depends on well, this, this is a, a standard DUI where, you know, it's, there's no real issues on what happened. Uh, a public defender might be good because he'll kind of just give you a better deal than you would be as if you had no lawyer at all. Yeah. But you don't need like a full on ten, fifteen thousand dollar trial attorney who's gonna get try and get the case dismissed or take it to trial. Sometimes you know, like you have to do the, the opportunity cost, right? But if you really like, you really need to win the case. You really need like some people, you know, they have licenses at, at risk, right? So yeah. like, I know, like I think some medical professionals, if they get a DUI, they get their license pulled. Got That's it. the time you need to get a lawyer who's going to fight this thing tooth and nail. Got it. So it depends like kind of on where you're at, but also like if you're hit with a higher charge, like DUI smaller, but felon, like giant felon, like, you know, you attempted murder, you're not going to want the, D, the PD because he has a bunch of other guys who are like, you know, like say you're just, you know, like, uh, for example, someone close to you, you, you die, they put it on you. PD is where he has a bunch of gang guys that are he's that he's just trying to burn them out because they've killed their homies or you know like they've yeah. been they've gotten another way so that's a, that's the murders he's concerned then you show up you have a lot to lose not like these guys you want a lawyer who's going to fight for you so the PD is not good for the higher level offenses or if you really have something to lose by playing out to the, to the smaller charge got it and then just kind of to explain for the guests so a PD is someone who's going to be proposed for you they're going to put forward for you for the by the court it doesn't cost you anything they will defend you because yeah. you're given a right basically to have a defense in criminal cases and so a public defender will be offered to you in the court system so you don't have to put any money up for them so if you are impoverished and you don't have the money to buy an attorney you essentially will be appointed an attorney by the court and they will go in and fight for you now of course with money you know typically with 
the legal field, the more you can spend, the better attorney you're going to get. So you're going to get somebody who's disinterested and just wants to get you in and off their desk. A lot of times with a public defender, when you could just go and get your own attorney if you really need to protect yourself. Yeah. And you also have to consider the crime too. Like, I, like sometimes people will call me for DUIs and I'll be like, what happened? Okay, you don't need a lawyer. Just ask them for the standard DUI. Like, Got it. I could take their money, but I feel bad because I, I know they're in such a bad position yeah. that if I take their twenty, like whatever, twenty five hundred dollars, yeah. when they go to plea out for this DUI, that's twenty five hundred dollars. They don't have to pay for their fines and fees and all the yeah. costs they have to do. So I kind of like, I know it's, it's, it's not good for my business, yeah. but I feel like it's not but good it for the world for me just to take advantage of people for no need. Look, you know? I completely disagree with you because I'm the same way with my PI cases, right? If somebody calls me and they get hit 10 miles per hour and they're going to go to a couple Cairo visits and their entire case is worth three, $4,000, I would rather just them keep the money because they're going yeah. through the pain and suffering than take a third of it. Exactly. And a lot of times I'll just spend an hour, I'll explain to them the steps because all they have to do a lot of times is just get their medical records and ask for a certain amount and I'll let them keep the money for themselves. Exactly. Honestly, it's, it's a lot more good fortune for yourself in the long run. People will always remember that shit. They're like, okay, this guy fucking helped me out he didn't pour me over the ringers and then let's say somebody else with a much worse dui or much worse case they really need you they're going to for sure come back to you and they're going to tell your friends you have to use this guy above anybody else he actually is a good individual it's not just about the money yeah. so it's like you might not say it's good business but at the end of the day i think it's good business is being a good human and it's all about being a good human yeah I agree. Cool. Okay. So we've gone a little bit deep into how you get to the point where after the arrest. So let's take it a step back. Let's talk about DUIs. I mean, I still don't understand DUIs. I just, they don't make any sense to me anymore. Okay. Like the other day I went to San Diego. I took an Uber from Orange County to San Diego. Some people might say, oh, that's expensive. It cost me $85 to go from OC to San Diego and then $85 to get home. That's cheaper than a hotel room. Yeah, and that's way cheaper than hotel room. Way cheaper hotel room, right? Especially like on like a holiday when I just didn't feel like driving, but we wanted to have a couple of drinks. Yeah. So I'm just like, I don't understand it because why don't you break down the costs uh, and break it down as much as possible of what it costs to hire an attorney and to deal with the entire DUI process. Okay. So let's, I'm just going to assume that this doesn't even go to trial, okay? Yeah, no trial. Let's, let's assume this doesn't it. even go to trial, yeah. okay? So firstly, you have your, your car gets impounded. That's about $500 to go get your car. Let's assume you're. Let's assume you just you have a, the standard first time DUI. You have your fines and fees, which end up to being anywhere from three to five thousand dollars. Your lawyers anywhere from twenty five hundred dollars. So let's break this down. So we got five hundred dollars just for the impound. Okay? Yeah, just for the impound. Then you have what's the range for the fees? For or the, the fines? fines? Anywhere from like three to five grand, depending on three to five the county you're so in. Now you're about five thousand five hundred. If yeah. it's a bad situation, good situation, thirty five hundred. Okay. Yeah, if you have bail, if your parent family bails you out, consider that money gone. That, it's probably about a good, you know, two to five grand, depending on how the, the bail they set for you, two to five grand. Okay, so we're looking at best case scenario around 5,000. Worst case scenario, you're now up to 10 grand. Yeah. And you haven't even gone to court yet. Yeah, they haven't even showed up in court yet. You haven't yet. even showed up in court yet. And then what's the next? Uh, we do cost? lawyers' fees. Lawyers' fees. Again, Another how much 20, do you usually 20, charge? 25 to four grand, depending on the DUI. Okay, so best case scenario, you're looking at, you know, eight grand. Worst case scenario, you're already up to 13,000, 15,000. Yeah. And then what else do they have to look at? Fines and fees, you're probably missing work for these court days, so you're losing yeah. out on income there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Not a lot. to mention the time you miss being in jail. Exactly. So that's a whole day of work that you could yeah. be making. You could potentially lose your job. So yeah, a lot of times, like uh, even with standard, first times they won't really require jail time. Yeah. But you have to do like a three month class, which costs you money in time, which is yeah. about anywhere from three to nine months. How much is the class? They charge you per class. Yeah, they charge right? you per class. That's, I think it's like twenty five bucks a class. What's the name of that? It's like a specific program. Well, there's Mothers Against Drunk Driving. I'm mad. Yeah. Yeah. So that you have to go that and some. Some counties actually make you go to the morgue. Got it. Go look at dead bodies that were, were happened because of DUIs. Got so it. you have to expose yourself to this morbidity that you don't want to see. Oh man, so those mad classes from what I've heard, you have to go like on a weekly basis, right? So there's the mad classes. It's just like a one day, five hour, four to eight hour class. But isn't there like weekly classes yeah. sometimes too? And then there's a three month, six month or nine month Fender program. Got it. So there's a three month, six month or nine month and it's every week, right? It's every week and it depends on what you blow when you, when you 
Okay. Or what your blood alcohol is Got it. when you get pulled over. Okay, so let's let's stick to the pricing. We'll get back to the numbers sure. there. So the pricing for that, you have to pay per class, right? I think it's like twenty five or fifty. Yeah, so twenty five dollar fifty per, per class. Okay, and for three months, and you have to go every week, right? Every week. Yeah. So you're then looking at a couple extra hundred bucks to potentially a couple thousand bucks. So now you're up to like sixteen, seventeen thousand. Not to mention you have to schedule your entire day around right. going to these classes, and then on top of that, you can't travel because you can't go anywhere because you can't can't miss more than a certain amount of classes, right? Sure. And then when we're on the travel subject, yeah. now you have to worry about the DMV, which is a completely different entity oh, from man. the court system. Yeah. So they kind of parallel, right? So then you have the DMV. Okay. If you don't, so within 10 days of your DUI or your arrest, if you don't file a request for a hearing, okay. your license is automatically suspended for, 30, for is automatically suspended after the 30 May day mark. Okay. So anyone who gets a DUI, Within those first days, the officer should give you a form that says request a DMV hearing. Yeah. Request the DMV hearing, even okay. if you plan on pleading guilty, because your license will automatically be suspended, right? So let's just imagine, well, first you have to consider the DMV hearing. That costs your lawyer time, money, so that's more money on the lawyer. So the DMV hearing is separate than... Well, the is criminal it hearing. Okay, so it's separate from the criminal court, it's a different place? Yeah, it's a different kind of... The DMV has its own process when you get a DUI. Okay, got it, and he has to do both of those things, yeah. correct? And, and so everybody always goes, why do attorneys cost so much? It's like, this guy's going to show up for you at least, what, four or five times for yeah, this case? Yeah, and then case. you have to subpoena the officers, that costs money. You have to yeah. pay for them to show up to these things. Yeah. Like, or at least the DMV part or portion of it, mm -hmm. right? And then, so that's another fee on the hearing. So if you if your lawyer does the DMV here, that's why I say twenty five hundred yeah. to four grand. So because yeah. if I know I'm going to plea him out, I don't even do the DMV hearing. I just request it, yeah. and then I'm like, where where did he pled out? We don't need the hearing anymore. Yeah, but I mean, let's also give a shout out to all the lawyers out there for dealing with the clients when the first word out of their mouth is, "I'm broke, I can't afford this." Sure. It's like you know, guys, they're not ripping you off, they're not screwing you over. A lot of times when they're going to these meetings, it's like you forget that they have to travel to this. They can't do any other work when they're work, when they're showing up to court for you. Okay, they have an arraignment, they have the DMV hearing, they have to show up multiple times, they have to reach out to the police officers, and they're always like, "Oh, your cost so much." It's it's like, yeah, you know, we cost so much because it literally takes time out of our work where we can't do other things. And it's like you have to block off, like, let's say in a basic DUI, no trial, how many hours do you usually have to put to work for a case like that? Um, so the mornings are usually about three hours each morning because driving, you sit there. Sometimes it's more. Sometimes it's five, six hours. But yeah. it's usually a flat, flat rate because if my hourly rate, it would just not make sense for the client to take me yeah. at an hourly rate. So it'd be like five hours the first morning. Usually it's about like three on the pre pre trials, and so our goal usually anywhere from two to four times. Got it. So anywhere from two to so that's about twenty hours in court, just sitting there, trying to like talk to the DA, even with the driving time. You know, so it's about twenty hours not being able to do anything for any other client. Okay. And you review the file. You talk to the client. You're making sure your paralegals are getting all the information. Yeah. You're doing the separate the subpoenas. So you're so. saying 20 hours, right? Well, 20 hours minimum. Okay, so let's That's say just court time. Then you have to review the file, draft the motions if you need okay. to. There's a lot involved in it. So let's say 20 hours, 20 times. Uh, let's say, okay, so the average like attorney rate is around 300. For like a top attorney, you're looking at $600 an hour, right? Let's say about the average 350 for attorney. 350, okay. So let's say, you know, that's 20 times three. So about 6,000, 6,500 to around 7,000. Yeah. And that's just court time. We're not even counting in the other time that you're having to do everything else. So really when people nowadays, they complain about an attorney charging them 2,500 to 500, 5,000, you're actually giving them a discount because you're giving them a package rate. Yeah. A lot of people scoff at those prices and it's like, you're, you don't understand this is that he's dedicating all the time and energy towards focus on your case he's actually taking time and cutting his rate so that he can do this for you so yeah. i don't know I, I feel that sometimes it's important to realize the whole scope of what people are doing and i think a lot of people when they say i hired an attorney and he's going to help me with my dui they don't really realize all the steps and all the stuff that you have to do to help them get out of these situations yeah. so now we we're talking so let's get back on track with the pricing so now we're up to like sixteen seventeen thousand dollars including the classes sure. and is there any other costs that would be associated with this that you think sometimes they have to do those breathalyzers on their cars right sure. so yes yeah, so let's get to the vehicles right so your, your license will get suspended so first you have to either unsuspend your, you get restricted license which costs money yeah and then you have to increase your insurance. You have to get the 215 insurance or whatever. Yeah. So that adds another, I think it's like another anywhere from like 50 to 100 bucks a month. SR15. SR15. Yeah, That's SR15. I deal with that shit all the time. Yeah, so you have to do the SR15 insurance. So for all of you that don't know, SR15 means you have a DUI. You're now a high-risk person for insurance. I deal with this in PI cases all the time. It means you're going to get... 
very low coverage for very high price. And you know, you should be buying higher coverage because you're a DUI risk is my opinion about it, but they charge you more. And so now you're gonna have to spend more money on that. So let's say that's another $2,000 a year. So now that's you're for three years, the SR 15 is stuck for three years. So you have to have it three years. So that's 2000 yeah. probably more a year for three years. So now you're looking at about over 20,000, low end 17,000 if you wanna get an attorney that doesn't know what they're doing. Yeah. So you're at 17 to 20,000 now, okay? And then, and, then, and then after that, the blowing thing, how much does that usually cost? 200 to install. Then they monitor you for the let's say for the first DUI, it's about three months, yeah, three to six months. Most time on the first DUI, they don't really do it, but unless, but I know in California, they're getting more strict on that, so it'd be two, it's 200 to install, 200 to take out, and 75 dollars a month for them to monitor you. Oh, you wow. have to pay them to monitor you, <laughs> that's the thing. So you're looking at another like probably a couple hundred bucks to another thousand bucks, yeah. or like 23, 24 thousand now on the high end, maybe closer to 20 on the low end, and then. At the end of the day, you're sitting there and if you're lucky enough to have the breathalyzer and you're lucky enough to get a license which allows you to still drive to work exactly. because you can't go anywhere else, then that's great. But if you can't get that license and they take away your license, then you're just shit out of luck. You can't drive Ubering to work, everywhere. you're out of a job, you still have to pay all these fees. This is this is basically your options, or I mean, I guess the other option would be to go to jail, right? You can go to jail for the money. Yeah. So, but that's but, only for your fines and fees. Yeah. But let's finish this, this calculation <laughs> up. So how much more is left? Is that pretty much everything? Okay, so then you have to, there's some other considerations that people don't think. Yeah. Could affect your citizenship. So you could be, like if you're, you have some kind of citizenship issue, yeah. It really puts you in jeopardy. Like Got it. it's not like so. Again, so you could get completely yeah. kicked out of the country for this, right? Yeah. But also, you have to consider about your like your job or your future jobs. Now you have a DUI on your record. Yeah. Do you get it expunged? That's yeah. another thousand dollars to get it expunged. Got it. Right. Well, you have to pay a lawyer, and then you you know you have to consider some some places don't really like people who have even DUI, so that could cost you a job Got or it. something even there because even yeah, though you expunge it, it, yeah, it's like I get it. You're just having a drink, but you're also not thinking of other people's considerations, right? Is your drink worth killing other individuals? Sure. I mean, I just see it all the time, like in the PI field, right? Like the worst accidents are always by the drunk driver. The drunk driver, that drunk asshole, he gets up and he just walks away all loosey goosey because he wasn't all sober. And then when he got in the accident, his muscles tightened up and then, you know, he just like gets out, walks out of the car perfectly fine, but it's always the person that gets hit, their life is destroyed. I had a client once got rear-ended by a drunk driver. Uh, she. She had $950,000 in medical bills that was actually paid by insurance. Usually insurance doesn't pay that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She had to get like her rib cage rebuilt. She had to have like her lung, both of her lungs collapsed. She was in a coma. And you know, this person that hit her, she didn't have good insurance. She ended up going to jail for four years. She deserved it. But it's like, why are you getting behind the wheel ever? Just, you know, sleep in your car, like worst case scenario, you know, hopefully you don't get in trouble for that. But you should never be drunk, drinking and driving. But let's get back to the calculation because I really want people to understand. It's, you know, a lot of times you see these people telling you don't drink and drive, don't drink and drive. It's not fucking worth it. It's just not worth it. There's never going to be a scenario where it makes sense to get in your car and drive, even if you had one or two drinks versus just taking an Uber. I get it. It's a fucking headache to get the Uber home the next day. Maybe have your girlfriend or a friend drive you. Who gives a shit? At the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're not getting stuck down this rut where you're having to spend 26, 25, almost 30 grand. If you get a good attorney, it's going to cost you over 30 grand easily, maybe even 40 for like the top, top guys to help them defend you on these DUIs. So we're back to, where were we on the calculation? I think we're about there. I think that's pretty much the only things I can think of right off the bat. Got it. There's also, they also require, I mean, financially, the DA kind of yeah. sometimes requires you to do, you know, like say like you hit something. Right, yeah. now you have to pay restitution. Yeah. So there's issues if, like, say, a lot of times, like, what, yeah. some people will be drunk, they they fall asleep at the wheel, and they'll yeah. like crash into like a different car, right? Yeah. And most of the time, your insurance, so yeah. you're, you're so the insurance companies, if you if you get in an accident, they have yeah. what's called or DUI, step you, down, right? It's called a drop down policy, drop down, right? right? So you're you usually have a hundred, three hundred, hundred, so hundred thousand dollar proper yeah. uh, bodily injury, three hundred total, and then you have a hundred thousand property damage. But if you get something happens with your DUI, 1535. <laughs> yeah, see, a lot of people don't even know that shit, right? Like, yeah. they, a lot of people don't even know that your insurance policy doesn't even allow other drivers most of the time to be driving your car. But so let me explain that one more time for everybody. So there's a lot of time in your policies. It says if you've been drinking and driving, you are not. A, so let's say you have a million dollar policy. It drops down to a 1530. So now not only are you going to have all these fines, but the person that you potentially hit or crash into, because a lot of DUIs, you've crashed into somebody, you're going to be sued 
And a lot of times, so I deal with this in PI, you can get the biggest judgment and people can just file for bankruptcy. If you get a DUI, you cannot file for bankruptcy. You are liable for those damages forever and you're liable for punitive damages depending on how serious and egregious the situation was. So it, it just compounds on compounds. And I also wanted to go back to the citizenship that you, thing that you said. So if you ever want to visit Canada, throw that out the goddamn window. You cannot visit Canada if you have a DUI. I have yeah. several friends who have called me and they're like, Joe, I want to go to Canada. You know, there's a festival or something sick up there. I want to go visit this chick, blah, 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 blah. Or I want to go up there and, you know, visit some friends. And I go, dude, you can't go. Canada does not want you and your DUI ass going up there and they're kicking you out and they're keeping you from going up there. So keep that in mind. It's, it's a big deal to get a DUI and people don't realize the causes and the hurt that they're causing other people, their families, because the burden doesn't just go on them. The burden is on your family because usually you can't afford to lose your job and pay all these fines. Now your parents, your friends, your girlfriend, your wife, it really just, it's, it's, a, it's a cancer effect on everyone that is involved, including you and anyone that's nearby you, your friends that might have to give you rides places. It's just, it's really the worst thing you could possibly do and it's gonna affect your life in a million ways. So now we've gotten the price. The price is around, let's say 25 to 30 grand. So let's think about this again. 150, $200 and like I'm going further than most people because when you're going to like do things, usually you're going a couple miles. I Most of my friends live in LA and San Diego. Yeah. So like I'm taking the $80 Uber each way, which is 150 bucks. That's expensive for, for like, like more than most people are gonna take. You're probably gonna spend 10 or 15 bucks because you're going to the bar around the corner, you're going to the bar down the street, you're going to the club that's a mile or two away and you don't wanna spend 40, 50 bucks and pick up your car tomorrow and you would rather spend 30 grand and ruin your fucking life? Like, get the hell out of here. What the hell's wrong with people? Does it, like, it breaks my brain. And it's probably because they have not seen this podcast and they don't understand the basics of it breaking down like that. But you really need to sit and think about the entire repercussions. You can even Google it. Like, all these prices and everything is broken down online. online. Yeah, yeah, do it's all online. But people don't want to take the time. They're like, fuck it, I'm going to drive. And then they put their girlfriends or their friends in the car at risk. They're like, no, I'm cool. I've only had like three or four or five drinks. And people don't realize that depending on what you drink that also has an effect on how drunk you are so let's talk about that so i know that when you get in duis a lot of times people think okay you blow over 0.8 you're going to get a dui but can't you just get a dui just because you've had one drink and you blew a 0.01 yeah so california california specific there's the the it's vc 23152 that's the dui vc kind of. is what california vehicle code california vehicle 23152 code. so there's the b portion which everyone knows about it's a DUI driving under the influence of alcohol with 0.08 or, or uh, with the blood alcohol content of 0.08 or above. So that's the one everyone's like, well, I didn't blow 0.8. Oh, wait, I didn't blow 0.8. But that's the B part. The A part is driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. So it doesn't matter how, if you have 0.01 in your system, you can still get in for a DUI. Yeah. And people always neglect that portion. They're like, well, I only got a 0.05. I'm like, well, they don't need the 8.08. Yeah. It's stronger for a 0.08, but you could still be 0.05 and they'll still take you in. Got it. Let me ask you a question too, since we're, since we're there. For a DUI with drugs, you know, like for marijuana and stuff, they just basically, they can do their tests to determine if someone is drunk, but it's the same consequences essentially, whether you're high or whether you're drinking, correct? Yeah, or, or, or meth, molly, whatever, whatever it any is. ecstasy, you know, and if you're on mushroom, whatever it yeah. is, like you can, they can do DUI drugs for anything. Yeah. And not only that, but people need to understand too, if you take Xanax or antidepressants yeah, prescription, prescription. and you are, let's say you take a bunch of NyQuil because you have the flu, you can get a DUI. Why? Like there's a multitude of different times. You need to take it seriously when the bottle or prescription that you have says do not drive on this. It's not just for your protection. I mean, it's for the protection of other people. You should not be operating heavy machinery or a vehicle, but at the same time, you can get a DUI. And people think, oh no, I'm good. I just took a Percocet, you know, my leg hurts, whatever. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I took a Norco because they're in pain. But there are specific reasons that it says warning in bright letters and says don't operate a vehicle. So you can get a DUI for any of those, correct? Yeah, anything. And Prescription is not really a defense because they'll say, oh, well, it's still a prescription, but you know, like you're still driving the influence of a, of a drug, you know, like a lot of yeah. people take, you know, some kind of anti-anxiety, like a ben some benzo ben or whatever, the benzos or whatever they call them. They'll get hit for DUIs. If they have a prescription, I'm like, well, they tell you not to drive with these, you know, <laughs> it's not a defense, you know? Yeah. So, and also on that point, it's like, the DUI is a public policy kind of law, but it defends everyone. I'm sure like, especially, I mean, you, because you, you see it, you, your clients get hit by, I'm sure a number of your clients have gotten hit by people yeah. with DUIs, but I'm sure we all know someone who's been affected by 
on the yeah. wrong end of a DUI. Like for, yeah. my, for me and my dad, when I was when I was like f three or four, some guy was drunk and collided with the front of his vehicle. Yeah. And my dad broke his back. He's never been the same. You can't. We lost that in my childhood with my dad because of that. And so that's kind of what led me away from DUIs because it, it didn't. It stopped correlating. How can I defend these people mm. when my dad? That, that happened to my dad. And so that yeah. kind of was. That's when I kind of was like, I can't really do this anymore. No, I mean, it's yeah. tough. I mean, it, it's really tough to defend those individuals. And, and I, I commend criminal defense attorneys, right? I get it. There's people that, you know, you went to a gala and you, you know, you had one too many drinks and you sure. were with your wife and you made a mistake. But even then, you just have to think about these things. And I'm not saying all people that do DUIs are bad people, right? Some of my best friends have gotten DUIs and, yeah. and I love them to death. It's just you need to think twice because it's not... You know, I get it. You don't want to deal with the headache of your car and all that shit the next day. And I understand. And, you know, you might be broke at that time. But it's more the risk that you're putting at somebody else to, to yeah. end their life. And that's really what you should be worried about. Yeah, it's the other people. It's a public Michael. policy. It's, it's, it's a public policy. Right. It's to defend the public from risky behavior that they didn't yeah. sign up for. You know, like, that's essentially what it is. Yeah. And I also, from what I understand, so like in OC, because you've done a lot in OC. Yes. Have you done some in other counties too? LA, San Diego, Riverside, where, San Diego. Where are they the most strict? Riverside and Orange County. Got it. Yeah. And it's probably because, why is that, do you think? River, I don't know. Riverside is a real strict policy on, on DUIs. Like, they don't mess around there. Like, you get a DUI, that's it. You, I've seen first DUIs go to jail for two weeks over there. Like, okay. they don't mess around there. Got it. Orange County is a little, is more strict. Um, because like LA, they'll pull you down to like what reckless is, but Got it. Orange County is still pretty tough. Like they just don't want people driving drunk on the roads. Got it. And I think I think maybe because LA and San Bernardino mm. might have like bigger fish to fry, given yeah. they're, 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 they have more murders and stuff like that. So I don't think they want to waste the resources there. But Got it. the Riverside DA and Orange County DA, they really like to. They're pretty hard on the DUIs. Okay, so let's go back now. We've gone through the horrible and the negative and the shitty parts about DUIs. Let's try to give the guests something that they can keep in mind. So let's talk to the people that have a cocktail or two and they go out and then they're driving home. I mean, this I've done this many a time. Sure. And, you know, at the same time we discussed, you know, a cop, if he feels you're intoxicated, he's going to go ahead and he's going to give you that DUI anyways. You're sure. going to go to jail. You're going to spend the night there and going to jail, you know, you're going to spend the evening there. You're going to have to pay bail. Sometimes they might let you out on your own yeah, cognizance, but let's talk about what happens. So let's say you get pulled over. You and I went to the bar. I'm driving, you know, we went there, we had a couple of drinks, I had two beers. I'm not intoxicated in any way, shape or form. The cop pulls me over. What should be my initial response or how should I be treating the cop? Um, I always say calm and respectful. Like, Cops are people. If you're mean to them, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna put their defenses up right yeah. away. Always respectful, calm. Two hands on the steering wheel as they approach. You know, yeah. like good evening, officer. That's what I would say. So I probably shouldn't open the window and be like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I smell bacon. Probably that's probably not the response that I should be getting, right? Or just fuck pigs, right? That's probably not what I should say. But Pretty. I mean, I've heard the gambit of things when clients have called me. It's like, why why the hell would you do that? Like yeah. this is an individual. You, he pulled you over you typically for a reason everyone's like oh you know i got i got id'd it's like no you're probably swerving or you were texting and driving and doing something to pull you over a cop there's hundreds of cars he's not just going to single you out if there's not a reason to single you out right yeah. even if it's your invalid registration right you're giving him a reason to and you're being irresponsible to do so but you always say to be respectful right always respectful because like let's let's say like a lot of cops wear, wear body cams right Let's say you weren't drunk, like maybe you were a little bit drunk, like maybe you had like one cocktail, but you were fine to drive, right? Yeah. But you're like acting like an asshole to the cop, right? Yeah. And the jury sees that. Like the jury's not going to like you eventually, yeah. right? Like yeah. you would take this case to trial, They're like here's how he was acting. We have a video of it. Yeah. You're effing the cop and I don't need to do this yeah. and blah, 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 blah. Your criminal defense attorney is going to say, yeah. well, he knew his rights. Yeah. The jury might be like, he's kind of a punk kid talking smack to, yeah. smack to a cop. Yeah. Like you have to, like, and... The cops aren't going to be re very receptive to that, you know? Like, yeah. I know some people who had a drink and the cops let them off because they were really nice to the cop. They were yeah. like, I'm sorry. I live, you know, I had one drink like three hours ago. I really yeah. just, you know, they feel bad. And the cop's like, all right, well, just get home safe, you know? Like, yeah. So, like, if, you, if you're respectful with them, I don't, like, that's always the approach. Being resist, resistant, like, guy has a gun and yeah. he has cuffs. Like, I'm not yeah. messing with that guy, you know? No, for sure. I mean, I've always, like, 
joked around, but like there's also a psychology aspect to if a cop pulls you over, right? Sure. So if a cop pulls you over and you immediately start saying to the cop, I have only had one or two drinks, now the guy's gonna fucking pull you out of the car. For sure. He's gonna make you take the test and he's gonna make you do the walk. Why would you even like don't, you know, or if somebody pulls you out, I didn't do it. You know, like you you immediately instilled in this gentleman's mind or general or woman, woman's mind that you've committed some sort of act. You need to stay cool, calm, and collected. And if you have some asshole in the car that is drunk, because I've had this happen before oh, yeah, where so I almost just... got fucked. I was in a car. I've had two drinks. But I had my shit-faced friend in the car next to me because I was driving him home. I was a responsible DD. And he just starts yelling all this obnoxious stuff. He's like, no, dude, fuck that. And just like, you know, he's like, can we just get out of here? He hasn't been drinking. And then at that point, he pulls me out of the car. And he's like, mm -hmm. you know, do the test. And I passed. But you just want to make sure everybody's going to be respectful. Yeah. And it's important to remember if you're a passenger, just be nice. If he asks you questions, answer the questions, but don't cause any reasons because a lot of people don't understand this because they've never been in this situation. But next time, let's say that you have a, a friend that's intoxicated, he's in a car in an Uber. If you're sober, you'll open that window. You can smell the alcohol. It's yeah. literally permeating from your pores. There's nothing you can do. Everyone's like, I've heard weird shit on the internet where it's like suck on Pennies, a penny, the gum, perfume. Gum, but yeah. then the guy Banaka, goes- Banaka, because then you kind of mess it. Yeah, but I've talked to cops and they're like, yeah, the second I smell all that shit, I know something's up, right? Like either yeah. they're covering the smell of marijuana or they're covering the smell of alcohol. Just be respectful. Be nice. Remember the police are human beings too. And remember, they're the fucking boss. Like at the end of the day, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Whatever you want, sir. I'll do whatever you want, sir. And just be as kind as possible and get out of there. Sure. Right. And let them tell you what you did wrong. Because yeah. if you didn't do anything wrong, they're just going to be like, look, I just want to make sure you're okay. I saw you come out of that bar. You guys, I saw you drinking. Maybe he was having dinner next to you and you just didn't notice because you guys are watching the football game, yelling, screaming. You know, you don't fucking notice the guy three tables away. You guys are just having a blast. But he saw you were having drinks. You just want to make sure you're all right. At the end of the day, they're doing their job. And I'm going to give police the benefit of the doubt that they're not all out there to do something bad. They're just trying to, to protect people and keep everyone safe. So you just want to be respectful, right? Initially be respectful, right? Yeah. Then they'll be like, there'll be something of, do you know why I pulled you over? Yeah. <laughs> Never give them a reason. Yeah. Never give them a reason. No. I don't know. Even if you know, I don't know why you pulled me over. Yeah. Why did you pull me over? I don't know. It's for you to tell me because the cop has the, he has the burden of proof on why he pulled you over. You don't have to tell him. Like he has the show, the court. Yeah. Because the, the why he pulled you over. Got it. So let's explain burden of proof. So burden of proof, in different types of matters, the burden of proof can vary. Okay. So burden of proof means who has to prove that this person was either guilty or not guilty. Pretty much. So in, in American law, we're all innocent until proven guilty. You're innocent until proven guilty. Okay. What that means is that the court and the officers of the court and the police officers have to prove that you are guilty. In the courtroom. So they have in the courtroom. Yeah. So they have a burden to do so. When you're being arrested. They don't really need a lot to go off of. No. I've seen cops like just walk around the car and they'll find weird shit wrong with your car. Like if you don't have a front license plate or let's yeah. say that your insurance paper, even though you showed them a picture, it was expired or maybe your license expired. They're going to find a way to fuck up your life and give you a headache and be like, hey, here's a ticket for this. Here's a ticket for that. And if you, you know, piss them off enough, they're just going to say you're resisting arrest and they're going to put you in jail. And guess what? There is nothing you can do. You're at the whim of this individual. You might be able to fight it later, but is it worth you being stubborn and aggressive to go to jail for and one then you night? Get, then you get hit with resisting arrest. You know, yeah. that, that's even worse sometimes than yeah. the original offense. Yeah. yeah, no, for sure. It's it's a compounding effect. Yeah. It just goes back to you know, be a human being, chill out, and just be nice because these people are just trying to do their jobs. Yeah. Okay, so you get pulled over. Let's say that you've had a couple of drinks. You're being nice, yeah. and the cop starts saying, you know, asking you questions about drinking. What what should be your response? I always say I don't want to discuss. The, the events of my, you know, my day or say something along the lines like, you know, I don't really want to describe where I'm coming or I don't have to, an obligation to do this. Because you don't have an obligation to do anything other than answer who your name, provide your ID and provide your insurance, right? Yeah. He's going to give you a ticket. You don't need to help him out to give you a ticket. Yeah. So like, they'll be like, where are you coming from? Be like, sometimes cops will follow people out of bars. They'll yeah. know. They'll be like, um, I don't really just want to disclose the events of yeah. my day, right? Yeah. So you don't have to tell him where you're coming from. But if he followed you, he knows, right? And then so what will happen is you'll be like, how many drinks did you have? Still, I don't feel like disclosing, you know, if you, because if you lie to him and they show like, you know, they pull a video up later, yeah. you video, you know, they can be, maybe go to the bar, get a like subpoena, get the video of you enjoying a cocktail, pull up your seat. You're going to look like a liar in front of a jury. So yeah. I don't have to disclose anything to you. Like if you're going to pull me over, if you're going to give me a DUI, give me a DUI, right? Like I'll give you my breath or my blood, but I'm not going to answer any of your questions. Like I'm not refusing any of this and I don't want to take your test.
Okay. So because if you answer his question of how many drinks you had, now you're admitting that you actually were drinking and driving, right? Or you have had some drink. Now he has probable cause Got it. to take you in for a DUI. Okay. So like now you give him the evidence he needs, you're building his case for him. Got Don't it. build this case for him, right? <laughs> like let him do the work. Yeah. That's his job. What is it? There's, um, there's these guys, they're called the Wasserman brothers and they're like called the pot brothers at large. Something like that. They have this thing on their social media. It's always called like shut the fuck up Fridays. Uh, and it's because if a cop pulls you over and you get in trouble or like, you know, you've done something or let's say you haven't done anything, it's just always better to say less people. When they say it can be used in a court against you, it can be used in a court against you. And most, I think, I don't know if it's a law now, but does everybody have a body cam? I'm pretty sure most officers have body cams. And if not, on it, yeah. I know their cars have cameras on them. So it's yep. just important to remember that it's either being recorded. Now, on the flip side, I've seen people pull out their cameras and record the officer. In my eyes, I say that if you see the officer doing something blatantly illegal, maybe it's a good time to do that. But if you're getting pulled over in the car, don't pull out your phone and start recording them. It's going to give him a reason, I feel like, to be like, what's going on here? Yeah. What's happening in this vehicle? And, you know, if you're a passenger, maybe the passenger can pull out the camera and record it. But it's still, remember, just psychology. It's like if somebody starts pulling out a phone and recording and assuming if you're just driving normal speed and you're not doing anything shady, you probably should just relax and just yeah. let them come check you out and go, right? Yeah. So, that, the first, calm, respectful. Don't answer yeah. any other questions. But... Don't refuse. Like the big, yeah. like the biggest, one of the biggest things is people will be like, "Why refuse yeah. the breath?" I believe. Then you're hit for so in California. If you drive in California, you you automatically consent to a search if you're suspected of a DUI. So you have yeah. to provide your blood or your uh, breath. Got it. Right. And if you refuse, that's an automatic one year suspension of your license. Got it. So I always tell people comply. Right. Like say, "Am I under the?" Repeat that one more time. So if you refuse a blood test, yeah, no matter what, yeah you lose your license for a year. Pretty much, yeah. Like, unless the, you can get a lawyer who, and then, so it's not even with the courts. It's with the DMV you're fighting with, right? So that's a completely different thing, right? The courts, the DMV, so let's, let's kind of break this up earlier. Let's go back a little. The jury trial in the courtroom, you have a judge, you have 12 jurors, you have DA, you have here. Yeah. If a DMV hearing, there's the guy who, who sits over your case is considered administrative judge. He works for the DMV. Okay. He's the judge and the prosecutor. Okay. So if you if you want to go pull up, like, uh, so the way to beat that one is you have to show that the cop didn't have probable cause to pull you over, but they almost 98% of the time find yeah. a reason to pull you over. So your license will be yeah. suspended for a year, at, yeah. make it, at minimum. Yeah, let's talk about, like, probable cause, because I think people need to kind of understand that. They probably hear this term a lot. So probable cause means that when you look at the totality of the circumstances that the officer believes that there was a crime or a crime yeah. that has been committed then, right? Is that the correct definition yeah. along that line? So a reasonable okay. belief that a crime has been committed. Okay. Presence, so right? reasonable belief that a crime has been committed, right? In his presence. Yeah. So a, a crime guys can be, you know, you don't have registration on your vehicle. You don't have your headlights on. It has to be like something that he can point to. And I promise you that a cop is going to find something to point to. Oh, He's going to have his partner. That's going to find something to point to. They're going to say you were, aggravating them that you were acting strange that your eyes were shaking they're gonna put a reason in their reports and guess what at the end of the day if you are drinking and driving i think you're gonna get little sympathy from a jury yeah. and they're gonna side with the officers who are protecting the other people that are out there on the road you know from getting hurt and so you really just want to take that all into consideration and just remember that at the end of the day your hands are in the hands of the officers and it starts there and if you start causing problems or ruckus you know you're going to end up getting in trouble most of the time. Yeah, they usually, I mean, they don't have a problem finding probable cause, right? You make a right turn that's a little too aggressive. Yeah. A lot of people have things right in between their mirror. You know, like yeah. you have your mirror and you have things hanging down. Yeah. That's an automatic violation. It's obstructing yeah. your vision. Yeah. They can get you on that, no problem. And yeah. you know, like they find little things. People, you know, broken tail light, whatever yeah. it is. You swerve. You do a lane, lane change on unsafe speed. Whatever, accelerating too fast. They'll yeah. find something on you. It's real easy to find probable cause for moving vehicles. Yeah, and not only that, but let's let's be clear about this. When you're going one mile per hour above the speed limit, you are now going an unsafe speed. Exactly. So if you think, oh, I'm just going a 46 and a 45, well, guess what? Now they have a reason to pull you over. So they will find a reason. That's what I'm trying to explain to the guests here. And it's just, they will find any reason. And you don't want to give them any reason. So just be nice, be kind, let this, you know, have this experience and move on. Okay, so now a lot of people call me after they've gotten the DUI and they're like, Yo, Joe, I got this DUI, but you know what? Screw that officer, he's a piece of shit. He didn't read me his Miranda rights. So I'm not guilty, 
I didn't get in trouble. This is not a big deal. Like, whatever. I, you know, he didn't read me the Miranda rights. I'm good, right? I can get out of this like tomorrow. So let's explain why that's the dumbest thing ever and people need to either do research on Miranda rights or just understand that that is not a valid argument and just because they haven't read you Miranda rights that you're not gonna get out of this. So why don't you give us a little bit of background on Miranda rights? Okay, so Miranda rights are rights, you know, the rights are made, they're, you're, 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 your rights are protected for you, by, or I guess they're protected for you in the Constitution, right? Rights to remain silent, right? Specifically, the rights to remain silent, silent, and you can't, say, you can't be forced to say anything that would hurt you or be, uh, be harmful to you, essentially. So Miranda is a law that was created by Arizona versus Miranda. We learned about it where the guy was compelled to give testimony against himself. Mm -hmm. So this only comes into play after you're detained by the officer, right? So like if a cop asks you before he arrests you, how many, cop, how many drinks did you have? And you say two, Miranda's not in here yet because you haven't been arrested yet, Got it. right? And it's only for statements that they're going to use to prosecute you. So if I see a guy swerving and I you know, take him out of the car, do the field sobriety test, I don't need his words to tell me that he's guilty. The only thing I need is him swerving, I give him the breath, and he was driving. So I don't even need his words. It only applies to the actual words you say, and that can't be used against you. So most people confuse it. Well, he didn't read my Miranda rights. Well, is he really using your words to, put, to, to prosecute you? I don't think so. So it doesn't even apply, you know? <laughs> That's kind of where the, mis the, the, the disconnect is for most people. They're like, well, they didn't read my Miranda rights. It doesn't matter. They're not using your words to put you in jail. And so that's the biggest issue with it. I don't know if that explains it for you. Or no, that does, it, that does explain it. I mean, a lot of people, I think, just don't understand what Miranda rights are. Yeah. And they think that they've seen the movies, right? And they've movies. seen, oh, they've yeah. seen like, <laughs> Law and & Order, and they've seen SBO, and they're like, oh, he didn't read me Miranda rights. I'm out of this. And it's like they all make it so dramatic. And, you know, the courtroom is not like everybody envisions it on TV. It is not the way you describe it. I mean, most of the time you're dealing with jurors that couldn't give a shit to be there they're falling asleep in the middle of testimony they they're a lot of them you know low income they don't have anything better to do and, and they couldn't get out of it and so they're stuck there and so people think it's this whole theatrical experience but it's not right and so they watch these tv shows and they think this is how it is so miranda rights are not a good way to get out of it what are some ways that potentially your dui could be uh let's say dropped i've heard like before like if the breathalyzer machine wasn't working correctly um, yeah. What are some other ways? So the breathalyzer, you can always question the validity of the breathalyzer. You can see, yeah. you can see, because what they'll do is they'll test it. You got to ask for the testing. Yeah. So that's like, um, you got to get experts for that though too. Yeah. So you have to have a lot of money to challenge that DUI that way, right? So the biggest way I used to get out of them was the stop, right? Why did you pull over my client, mm -hmm. right? Is it because he just was leaving an area where there was a bar and you just thought, because that's kind of probable cause, yeah. but if he's, if he's driving straight in a lane, why did you pull him over? Just because he left yeah. a bar doesn't, it's not enough probable cause for you to pull him over. Yeah. So a lot of cops just pull you over because they think you left a bar. Yeah. You know, they kind of hang, they hover around the, like, remember we were in Fullerton, right? Downtown Fullerton. What's it called when they like, kind of like hang out and they like pretensely like, right? Yeah, it's a pretension, pre pretextual, uh, stop, or pretextual uh, arrest or whatever. Got it. And that, stop. and that can potentially like be, squash later because yeah. it's like fruit of the poisonous tree if they're trying to like catch you before you've done anything illegal exactly right? okay sometimes they'll follow you for wait they wait for you to do something illegal right so there's they can drive and they'll be like okay i'm gonna follow this guy until he does something illegal so now you're freaking out you see a cop behind you yeah and you're like driving the best way i do it or and i've heard you do it is that you like whatever it is the speed limit cruise control it yeah now you don't have to worry about the elijah the light turned off now you don't have to worry about the, the issue of your speeding, right? You want to do all your signals. So, but they just wait for you to mess up. And that's kind of like, it. They, just need a, they need a minor traffic violation to pull you over. That's it. Got it. Okay. So now we're at the point, you've been arrested or you've been pulled over by the cop, right? You've been arrested or you've been pulled over. And now you're getting to the point where you're going to get taken to jail, right? So you're either going to do the breathalyzer or you're going to do the blood test. So let's talk about the breathalyzer. So the breathalyzer, it's 0.08, correct? 
All of them. I mean, yeah, we're like we well, yeah, so, yeah. said it can be below. But yeah, the but point the, 0.08 is the California. That's like what the law says, correct? But, well, yeah. Well, the point 0.08 is the specific B one, but you can still get it for, for the point 0.07, point 0.06. But they'll test you whatever do you are, whatever you blow in. Yeah. If you have seen them with point 0.07, they'll so still give them to you for point 0.07. Got it. And then if you go into the jail to get the blood test, yeah. they just take your blood and they're able to determine. Same now, thing. I've heard something about the blood test. I've heard that if you know you've had a couple of drinks, and then you are like, fuck it, I should just take the blood test. You should go in and get it because now you'll be below a point oh eight. But what you're saying is that's dumb and that's stupid because it doesn't matter. Even if you are below a point oh eight when you go in, you can still get a, a DUI because they believe that you were driving under the influence. Yeah, there's some strategy to it, right? So like, yeah. um, say you had like, so your body metabolism metabolizes the alcohol in your system, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're at the scene of the crime, right, and you had you're like you know you had to, your last drink like three like an hour ago, right? Yeah. By the time they get you to the, by the time they get you to the like the, the hospital and they pull your drug or they take you to the jail yeah. and they pull you, you're metabolizing more. So your DUI, your your blood alcohol will lower by the time you get Got it. to the actual, you know, or to, to the, the facility. To the facility, right? So you you can buy yourself time, so you lower your blood alcohol level. Mm -hmm. But like, let's say for example, you took a shot. You're like, like, say, like uh, you're gonna go, you pregame, but you're like, I'm gonna take the shot and I'm gonna drive down the street yeah. real quick to my favorite bar, right? Yeah. It hasn't hit your system yet. So yeah. you might wanna blow right there because it's not in your blood system yet, you know? It's like giving people cheat hacks. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. like a hack, right? You it's not, it's, it won't go into your blood yet and it won't metabolize. Yeah, so you, you so, but no, so you wanna take the breathalyzer. Yeah, there, at right? that time. Yeah, yeah because, because it's not in your hack. system yet, it's just kind of chilling in your stomach, right? Yeah. So it just depends, you know, like it, there is some little hacks here yeah. and there. And so that might get you out of it. Yeah. But like, I know that some, be, like you, some people like try to look up the ratios, like, oh, I've had this many drinks and this many hours. But I think what it comes down to, again, guys, is just don't drink and drive. If you're going to have even one cocktail, it's literally cheaper to like Uber around. And not only that, but if you're going with a friend, you get one Uber, they get the next exactly. Uber. And then guess what? It costs you half the price. Or if you're going with a group of friends, they have it on the app. You can split the cost. So cost should never be the issue. And if you're really that broke, tell your friend that has money, hey, can you get me an Uber and send me to this place? Because if you're loved or if you're liked even a little bit, I promise you, they would rather send you an Uber than to see you get a DUI. It's just, it's not worth it. The headache's a nightmare and it's just an absolute, absolute horrific scenario for everyone. One other thing I guess we didn't even talk about was the effect it has on you. Like yeah. you have to deal with this for six to months to a year. Yeah. Like it's a long process. It's not like yeah. an easy process. First, okay, so first you get arrested, then you're like, you get let out. Usually the court date's, well, even now with Corona, it's even more pushed out, right? Yeah. So court date is now like four months away. Yeah. So you're like freaking out. Like what's gonna happen with my court date? I'm like, yeah. I'm get a lawyer. Now I have to get a lawyer. Then the court day, it's like, okay, we're gonna put it out a month. Now you're worried like the whole time. It's not easy to deal with this kind of stuff. No, it's for sure. It's gonna make people depressed. It's gonna fuck with your head. It's gonna make you feel all kinds of ways. You know, you're gonna pro like I know people that have lost relationships because they've been going through a DUI. I know people they lose their jobs. Like there's nothing positive that comes out of a DUI for anyone involved, especially you. And it's gonna take you probably a year, you know, of dealing with it, maybe two of dealing with it. And then on top of that, it's going to take you a year to become the human being you were again, once you've got your shit back in order, you know, you're not having to deal with all those classes and you gain your confidence back. Cause a lot of times, you know, when you're going through this, you're not going to love yourself. You're not going to love what's going on and it's going to affect who you are as a human being and just building back up to who you were before is going to be a long process. So, you know, it comes down to again, is it worth the one night of drinking and driving or do you just want to get your head on straight and not do this ever? Yeah. So, all right, so let's talk about now. So we've now gone to, the, gone to jail. So when you go to jail, basically there's nothing you can do. So let's talk about what it means to be in jail, right? So when you're in jail, like from speaking to clients and talking to everybody, what's, what's it like? Like what do they say about it and what does that feel like? I don't like it. They're like, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, I, I'm, I'm your lawyer. I can't pay for your bail. <laughs> you yeah. know, like you got to call someone to get you out. You yeah. know, like they don't like it. They're in like, yeah. you know, like, they give you clothes that you don't want to wear. Yeah. You run. Yeah, probably a lot of people, worse people than do, do DUIs. They're like yeah. afraid of their cellmates. I knew, I had a, a client who got beat up while he was in jail for DUI. Yeah, because he, one of the guys in there didn't like the way he was looking at him. Yeah, so he shows up. I, I, I like I see him, and he has a giant black eye and his yeah. mouth split. And I'm like, what happened? He goes, oh, some guy beat me up while I was in jail. Yeah, and the other guy was like a felon, you know, like yeah. a, like a legit felon, you know, like you don't know what. The, 
the people around you are yeah. kind of the, the, the level of criminal you're in there with, you know? <laughs> so you're in jail, you know, you have no, no rights, everything's taken away, they're giving you probably spam to eat, you know, you're stuck in there all night, it's probably disgusting, you're with a bunch of hobos, most likely, that are also either high on meth and high on some drugs, probably in a big cell with like 10 other people. Sounds lovely, right? It's the yeah. same thing as like staying at the Montage here in Laguna Beach. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's all in all a horrible experience. And I think a lot of people have a huge misconception too. They think that they can call their attorney and their attorney is gonna show up to the jail and walk them out like within yeah. five minutes. Let's be clear. We can't do that. We cannot walk to the jail. We cannot let you out. We cannot no. help you in that way. All we can do is point you to a bail's bondman. Exactly. You're going to pay your bond. And then guess what? They are still going to keep you until they feel that you are not intoxicated. So if you're shit-faced, you're going to probably be in there for two days. One. They like to give you one day. Usually it's like one day. And then you'll be like, call all right, call your family. Yeah. That's what happens. You know, and then they'll let you out on, it's called own recognizance, yeah, right? OR, yeah. So what does OR mean? It's like promise to appear to court. Got it. Much, yeah. So you're saying you're going to appear in court, you'll post your bail, and they'll let you out. If you are, you don't need bail. But Got it. Usually, what, like, most of the time, if you're just, like, a standard DUI, they'll keep you overnight. Depending on how, like, what you did, like, if you hit something, yeah. they'll make you post bail. If not, usually it's like, all right, go home. Well, let's say somebody gets caught with drugs. Do you think they'll be let out on OR? Yeah, it depends on, I mean, the amount of drugs, right? If Got it's it. like, you know, they have, even, I mean, weed is legal now so they probably yeah. won't but it's like they're driving on the phones without the drug but if it's like they're driving on all methed out right they might not you know like so. got it so i mean you, there's a so there's a chance that you can be let out on your own recognizance which means without posting bail but a lot of times you will have to post bail depending on how severe your crime was if you hurt somebody you'll probably have to post bail for if sure it's like a car accident yeah so in bail means that you're gonna have to pay you know thousands of dollars to a bail's bondman to guarantee that you're gonna appear to court and it's one of those things that you don't want to get in that situation. Now, so let's go back to jail. It's probably the worst experience of your life. You're stuck. You have no rights. Then you'll be let out the next day. You're going to have the walk of shame. You're going to get picked up by your friend or family. They're going to give you back your stuff. And then you're going to have to go back to your court date. Now, let's fast forward. Went through the initial couple of court dates. But let's talk about that DMV hearing is usually initially in the beginning, too. And do they show up to that? Or they can also have an attorney show up for that? For the, yeah, you, I mean, usually, I mean, they can do it themselves, but usually the client, uh, the attorney does it. The client doesn't have to appear for those, but attorney does it on his own time. Okay, got yeah. it. All right, and then now we are a couple appearances in, right? And let's say that you want to fight it, you end up going to trial, and then do you know what the success rates for DUI trials are? Oh, they're horrible. Yeah, it's it, they're almost worse. It's harder to get, like, it's easier to get someone off of murder sometimes than it is DUI because it's so simple to prove a DUI. It's yeah. Just, he was driving, and he had alcohol in the system, and that's all you have to prove. Yeah. And so the guy said he was drinking. He put the cop up there, said, so you know, he blew this. Yeah. I saw him driving. Here's a video of him driving. Here's a video of him doing the test. He failed the test. Yeah. Here's a video. Here's a, you know, here's, here's his blood alcohol. Yeah. And that's it. That's all they have to show. Yeah. What's your defense for that? Yeah. Like, there's not really a way to beat that unless I was about to die and I need to go to the hospital. You have, you know, there's certain defenses to DUIs, but... You're not, most of, the, most of them don't apply, you know, like. Got it. Um, I didn't even know that there was defenses like that. Yeah, there's, there's necessity, there's other, other defenses, you know, but like most of them don't apply because you're yeah. not rushing your girlfriend to the hospital, you know. Yeah, when you've been drinking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Unless, you, unless you really, unless you were blacked out and, you know, something happened to her where she, you know, slipped and fell and, and was, there are certain defenses, but most of the time they don't apply. Got it. So what's your defense? I wasn't drunk. Yeah. <laughs> like there's no defense really. So it's really hard to beat them. Got it. So for all of you out there that think you're going to beat a DUI, you're not. You're probably going to end up pleading down and you're going to end up having to move forward. Now, let's talk about like jail time. Typically, let's say you have a basic DUI. Do you think you're going to see jail time? First time DUI. First time, not really. You won't really see a yeah. see jail. What if you hurt somebody? Yeah, you'll see jail. You'll see jail. For, uh, for, uh, so then it becomes, fel there's, well, there's, what I've been generally just talking about is misdemeanor DUI. Yeah. Then there's felony DUI. That's a whole different ball. So what usually raises it to a felony? Bod a bodily injury, hurting someone, that really changes the game. Got it. And for all of you that don't understand, so misdemeanor versus a felony, 
Uh, a felony typically is going to cost you more across the board because now more time, gonna, more money, yeah, yeah, more time, more money, more court appearances. On top of that, a felony never gets off your record, right? No. And you can't even vote if you're a felon. There's a lot of problems, and it's also extremely difficult to get a job if you're a felon because it's really hard. You can't expunge that. Am I correct? So you can do what is called a reduction. You could reduce the felony to the misdemeanor, then move there, get that misdemeanor, you're going to expunge. But well, let's say that you actually get charged with the felony and you keep it. What are the sure. repercussions of that? Yeah, well, you can always there's a there's a there's a reduction for the felony okay and so then you can reduce that and then once you get that to reduce to a misdemeanor you reduce that to you explain the misdemeanor got it what if you get convicted with the felony same thing because you're playing out to the felony so okay whether you convicted or you plea out it's the same effect okay but you can always try and reduce it yeah. okay understood but for but, those of you if you do end up getting a felony on your record even if you do end up reducing it at some point it's really bad for you right a lot of people won't hire felons they just won't even speak to you and it, there's a lot of problems that will come along with it so just keep that in mind well, even just a, even like if you're a keen employer, there's it's statutory codes, right? So when it's like reduced from felony to misdemeanor, right? It'll be like misdemeanor pursuant to this penal code. So yeah. if I'm an employer, I know what that means. Like this guy had a felony, reduced it, you know? Like, yeah, I got it. So you can keep an eye on. Yeah, you know, you know. It's not like it's not yeah. like it never happened. It's just if you know the codes, you'll know what really happened in the case. Okay, cool. Understood. All right. So um, in regards to DUIs, you know, we've covered most of the bases here. We've said, you know, if, even if you go to trial, you're probably not going to win. You know, there's different levels of DUIs. And so initially with a misdemeanor or if you hurt somebody, maybe how many days in jail do you think you would see? Depending, is it, does it depend on how badly you hurt them? Yes. I mean, yeah, if you kill the guy, you're going, it's going to be a manslaughter, right? If yeah. it's bad, like, you'll probably, you could see up to, you know, felony, you know, it's probably three to five. You could get it to the three years of seeing, you know. Got like, it. it just depends on how bad you hurt the people. Okay. And then if they're going to recover, right? So, yeah. like, sometimes people don't recover. Like, you cut, yeah. like, you hit someone, they lose a leg. Yeah. You're going to go to jail for a while on that one, you know? So, like, it just depends. Like, they kind of try and balance it out, right? But most of the time, if you hurt somebody, you're, you're pretty much going to guarantee yeah. your time. One interesting thing that I've noticed, too, a lot of people with DUIs are usually repeat offenders. Most people that get a DUI, yeah. they get two. They might even get three. But a lot of them do get two DUIs. Do you, have you noticed something consistent like that? Do you think it's like a personality type or they just don't learn their lesson? Like, that breaks my fucking brain. I just can't even comprehend it. Yeah, okay, great. So, yeah, <laughs> you're going to have one client. Yeah. yeah. I got him, almost got him off on a DUI, right? So he was like, yeah. he blew a point two. I reduced it to a yeah. point oh eight DUI. Like he was supposed to yeah. be, like, it was supposed to be a felony DUI. And like a month, like three weeks after he bled out to that one, he got another DUI. Same bitch. And I was like, what the, f what what like didn't yeah. we talk about this? Like yeah. one and done, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, that's it. Move I on. I couldn't believe it. Like I was like, dude, I just I just moved mountains for this guy. Yeah. He was supposed to be like a couple years in jail, and I was like, I got him a little slap on the wrist with a little yeah. AA, right? And I was like, what? The? And he calls me, he's like, I got no DUI. I'm like, oh, yeah. shit. You yeah. know, like, yeah, I and I was you. like, now we're fucked, because if you get a DUI while you're still on yeah. probation for your first, yeah. your license of medic suspended for a year, yeah. and then you have the 18-month program, you're paying yeah. double the fines and fees, yeah. you for sure have the breathalyzer in your car for at least six yeah. months to a year. Yeah. So it becomes a lot. Yeah, and I've noticed that, like, my, my clients, either they learn from the first one or it's just, well, here's some money you're my lawyer you're supposed to take care of this. And they don't really learn. Like, just be, like, yeah, just a process. Yeah. yeah. So for, for some reason, like, like the middle class learns, but I feel like if you're like richer, you're just like, yeah, my lawyer, it's whatever. You know? Yeah, like, whatever. You know? I'll just deal with this and I'll move on. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. that's kind of what I've experienced. Yeah, so let's, so let's talk about, you said this was like a difficult client. So I know you mentioned to me before. So when you worked at the DA, there's usually three different types of people that come in that have been convicted of a crime. So why don't you break that down for us, just because I think this is great and it's a real true analogy to how human beings are. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and explain what you learned there. Sure, it was, it was it's DAs and my own clientele, right? There you have three kind of clients. First is the innocent one, very few and far between. Yeah, like, like probably like 2% of people. Not, I mean, yeah, innocent. like very few, like very, I had one innocent client out of all my yeah. DUIs, one. Yeah, but like 80% of people yeah. think they're innocent, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, everyone else was, I didn't do it. And, and as a, even in my insurance defense, I see, I deal with car accidents all day long. They're like, it wasn't my fault. Well, I'm like, you rear-ended the guy. How's it not your fault? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I have a case right now. This girl rear-ended my client, and they're saying that my client's more, more than 50% at fault. I can't wait to have this argument in yeah. court, but just, I'll let you continue. Yeah, so, I mean, that's kind of the just, so the first one's the innocent, right? Yeah. Then you have the person who knows they did it, but they feel bad. Yeah. Those are the people who are like, oh my God, this is the worst experience of my life. 
They take that experience, they learn from it, they never, you never hear from them again, other than, you know, maybe a text message like, oh, thanks for this. But it's, they, they know, they know they messed up. They're like, I just, they, just, I just don't want to go to, you know, they, they feel bad, yeah. they learn from it, they do everything, they take everything seriously. Mm-hmm. And they like, take it as a learning experience and they grow from it. Yeah. And then you have the other client and client who's, here's some money, get rid of this for me. Yeah. You're my lawyer, aren't you supposed to take care of, make this go away for me. Yeah. And those people either, they typically are like, this is just another like inconvenience in their life. Like they yeah. don't really see that maybe they had a problem, you know, like they had some hand in this happening. It was just more like, that was a bad night. Here's, I'm, here's some money, it makes this go away. I don't want to do anything. Those people tend to be repeat offenders or they don't take it as seriously, you know? Got it. And then there's the people that are guilty, right? Or that's the last person that you just described. No, these are the, yeah, there's, then there's the guilty people who, well, no, there's the guilty people who are like, feel bad about it and mm-hmm. this really guilty people don't give a shit you know yeah. like, you're like here's my lawyer i'm giving you money here's money make this go away yeah i you know speaking of like clients like that i remember i had one client he like he was so guilty he's like you know he was intoxicated he crashed his car and then a cop pulled him over his car was destroyed mm-hmm. and he calls me cussing out he's like the fucking cop you should have never pulled me over you didn't have a reason to i'm like dude your front bumper was falling off and you had broken glass yeah <laughs> and you were shit-faced yeah. what do you mean that you didn't have a reason to pull you over like you know it's like that victim mentality and like yeah. look there's a difference between a victim and like a victim mentality it's yeah, like sure, people that sure. think that they're victims of everything and that's the type of person that you don't want as a client because yeah. everything's always somebody else's fault it's always somebody else to blame it's like no you're the idiot that did this. Like, just try to be as kind as possible. Let's try to get this resolved and move forward. Um, yeah, so I've dealt with all that. So let's talk about, um, you know, who are some of your most difficult clients or if you want to tell us a story of maybe a super difficult client that you've dealt with in this realm. I'd love to just hear so we can learn, you know, whether there's attorneys listening or just people that deal with difficult clients. You always learn a bunch just from hearing what you have to deal with on a daily basis. So one of my most difficult clients is I am it was like a favor for a friend and yeah I, I gave a like so first i stopped giving discounts because like when people want to nickel and dime their lawyer it's like for me it was like like i would do it when i first started being a lawyer because it was like i need the money but then i realized the kind of client you would get with that it was like they weren't the quality kind of client i wanted they were always like yeah. they wanted the world but they weren't given the world you know yeah. like there's a give and take to this right <laughs> and so i took it and it was like he had, he had a DUI and he called me every fucking day. And I'm like, yeah. there's nothing I like, nothing's happened between the last yesterday and today. It's not like a DA called me and was like, no. oh, we dropped your case. And it was yeah. like, if, if that happened, I'd call you. And I would tell yeah. him like, listen, I can't, like, I understand this is your case. You're worried about it, but I can't, I have other clients I have to deal with. And I'd give you the information. It was just constant harassing and constant nagging. Yeah. And I was like, dude. So I dropped the client. I was like, I can't, I can't just take this. It's yeah. affecting all my other clients. I yeah. can't do it. I think it's a burden and kind of like the cross that you bear when you give your clients your cell phone number, right? Yeah. So that's something that like my clients love about me. They all have my cell phone. They can call me whenever the hell they want and they can reach out, but they don't understand the basic boundaries, right? Like, especially too, when you like represent friends, it's like, I get it. This is not a friend thing. You know, like don't text me at 10 o'clock at night about, you know, what I'm representing you about, like text me during normal hours. And I get, I get that we have that relationship, but let's keep work during work hours. And then there's the clients like you're describing where they literally call you all the goddamn time. And it's always the smallest cases, biggest discounts. And it's like, they harass you more than anything. So one tip I want to give you that I did that really helped me a lot. So with those problem clients that people that call nonstop, I will literally block out times. I'll tell them, this is your hour every week. Call me during this time and I will make sure that I answer all of your questions. I want you to write them down, get them in a nice sheet, send me an email and we'll sit and we'll spend an hour doing it. And then I make that their designated time. And I literally like, it's like putting a child on timeout. It's like, hey, I get it. You have me, I'm representing you. But you need to be respectful of my time because you're not my only client. And if I had an update, I would call you, right? Like that's the biggest thing a lot of people don't realize. They, they always hear about attorneys they never hear from, right? Yeah. They're like, I just spoke to his assistant, I spoke to him, apparently like, well, that's not how I work, and I know that's not how you yeah, work. Call so if your yeah, attorney's yeah. like the homie or he's somebody that you know and you know is a good attorney, he's gonna call you when there's shit to talk about. He's not ignoring you and not you know letting you know what's going on. It's because there's nothing going on. Yeah. And so 
you know, setting those boundaries. And then I try to like, actually like we have a sheet that we give our clients when we first sign them up, it breaks down the entire personal injury process. So they know whether there's something they're missing or not. And they never think there's anything missing. Cause I follow my plan. They know the plan and they understand the whole process. I think it's a, usually a lack of communication in the beginning. Yeah. And so it, you can kind of set those boundaries. It really helps a lot. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So let's, um, so let's kind of segue topics. I know we've been talking about DUIs. Let's get the basics for everyone, and then we'll segue into the next next thing we want to talk about here. So one is it's going to cost you about thirty grand for a DUI. Don't fucking do it. Yeah. Be nice to police. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Answer the questions other than here's yeah. my name, here's my ID, here's my insurance. Yeah. If you're going to get arrested <laughs> and you know you're about to get arrested, just be quiet. Go go through the ringers, and don't really don't really sit there and try to argue about nothingness. It's not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to be beneficial. And then the whole process is going to make you depressed for a year. You're going to have to do classes. There's just a multitude of reasons. Just keep in mind that this is the wrong way to go and don't do it. Take an Uber, take a Lyft. You know, if you really need one, call me. I'll pay for your Uber and Lyft. I have no problem supporting a friend anytime because it's always better than a DUI because I've seen my friends go through it and it's a nightmare and it's emotionally a nightmare and I feel so bad for them and you just want to give them a hug, but there's nothing you can do to fix it because it's a process. Mm -hmm. You have to go through the process. Criminal system is very interesting because a lot of people don't even understand the magnitude of what they've done because they get in trouble and they don't even see their court date for months down the road. And so it's like, it's, it's a weird system, but it's the best system we have. Yeah. So we're going to segue. So a couple questions I love to ask friends are, I want to talk about, you know, what are the habits that you believe makes you successful, right? You've had your own firm before. You're now working at one of the biggest firms in the country. You are successful in many different ways. You have a very good routine, but what are maybe one or two of your habits that are your favorite habits that you do on a regular basis that you could share with us and maybe we could learn something from? Sure. So for me, um, okay, so one of my my things is like I try and I do a lot of self care, like not only like primping, but you know, like I do like everything that's important for me, I do at the beginning of the day. So I work out and I meditate and I read. That's the first thing I do when I wake up. Because for me, like that stuff gets me in a good mood. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm super disciplined. Like I did yeah. the MMA, I would train three times a day. Like when something's in my mind, I just go, go all out for it. Yeah. So for me, a big part of the mixed martial arts or, you know, the martial arts generally transferred to law school. You we went to law school together, but yeah. it makes you dis you have to have discipline. And discipline is the best definition I have for it is doing the shit you're supposed to do when you don't feel like doing it. And, yeah. like, and it takes time. It's like the martial arts got me ready for law school because yeah. sometimes I don't want to train, but I would go in and train. I'd go in the morning, I'd go in the afternoon, I'd go in the evening, right? But yeah. sometimes you don't want to train three times a day. Yeah. But I would do it, you know. But then then I got used to this is just normal. Like I I, yeah. I learned discipline. Like Discipline, I think, is one of the hardest things to get, but once you get it, it's so easy to transfer in all areas of your life. Like, I did the mixed martial arts, then I did law school, then I did bodybuilding. Yeah. Right? And even in, like, my own business and even my work now, it's discipline. It's do the shit that I have to do when I don't want to do it, and then you don't have any problems, right? And you'll notice that, like, the more discipline you get, the easier like, your life is. So, like, yeah. I think, uh, what's it, Jocko Willis or whatever? Yeah. He's like, because I'm disciplined... Yeah, uh, because I'm disciplined, I can do everything else. Yeah. Like I have like a four pack right now and I'm not trying to brag, but, and I can eat like a piece of cake and nothing will happen to me because 98% of the other time I'm eating yeah. what, egg whites, <laughs> chicken yeah. breast, yeah. you know, broccoli, white yeah. rice, like I'm eating clean. So when I need to do the things I want, I actually want to do, yeah. it's not a big deal. But yeah. you know, so like that's for me, it's always been like, I can transfer the discipline in all areas of my life. And I think that's for me, that's what cha changes everything for me. Got it. Yeah. You've almost like made it part of your lifestyle, right? Yeah. It's like there's like certain non-negotiables. Yeah. A lot of people, they don't understand that concept, right? If you're always working out and you're eating healthy most of the time, it's okay to have a snack every once in a while. But when your entire lifestyle is eating like shit or doing that, then it, then it doesn't, you know, it doesn't coincide with, with being healthy. Yeah. Now, I completely agree with you in the morning routines. I think it's so important, right? Like, and this is something that you've taught me because a lot of times I think just being attorney our entire lives are dedicated to helping people solve their problems, right? We're exactly. problem solvers, and from the moment we wake up, like I get, I spend about seven hours of the day on the phone yeah. dealing with other people's shit and trying to fix their problems. And so for that reason, if you don't spend a little bit of time for yourself, you're just gonna feel like you're getting dragged through your day instead of you being in charge of your day, right? So I agree with the three things you said. I always try to read um, I'm getting better at the meditation thing and making sure a little bit of light exercise. But for me, I like, I make sure I have like a very strict routine with what I'm eating every morning, mm -hmm. what I'm drinking. I usually have like this brain smoothie. Like it's very important to give yourself some time to yourself and not only that, but 
Take some time away from your phone for at least the first like half hour, an hour, right? Yeah, I don't even look at my phone for like the first hour of my day. Cause yeah. like, that's the world trying to impose itself on me. Yeah. I just need me time for like an hour and then I'll allow the world to come to me. You know? <laughs> Dude, it's so smart. I mean, like I didn't realize how much stress and anxiety, like, I mean, qu quarantine is like, we're all working from home, right? Yeah. And like, I worked from home for a lot of the time too, but at least I would go out, I would network, I would do other things. But now just being at home and not being allowed to go anywhere, right? This is the first time I've gone somewhere in a couple of weeks when it comes to like business type stuff. Your office in the room that you do work in, like your entire home almost gives you an ambiance of like anxiety because you know where you do work is a couple feet away, right? So like this last week I went to Big Sur with a couple of friends and just disconnecting from my phone and not like my phone didn't work. It was the greatest That's gift good, anybody's yeah. ever given me. I couldn't get a text message if God himself tried to beam it. It just was not going to happen. Mm. So for five days, all I could do was be present and hang out with people. And all I can say is I have not felt that like low level of stress and anxiety in years. Mm. And it was something that, you know, you look at your phone even if it's just a text message, right? So I remember listening to a podcast. It was, I believe, a Tim Ferriss podcast or it was um, Mind Valley, And they had a psychologist on there showing you that your phone, when you look at it, the colors of your phone actually give you dopamine either stress hits, right? or dopamine, right? Yeah. So like the red notifications give you stress. And we actually are addicted to stress as human beings, right? So we like to see that we have a thousand emails, yeah, yeah. that we have... 40 text messages, it means people are thinking about us. People need me, people are paying attention to me. And you know, it's great, you are, you're blessed and you're very, you know, it's, it's amazing that people want you that much, but we're literally addicted to that stress. And so when you don't give yourself at least like an hour of the day where you can like give it to yourself, not be stressed out, because the second you look at an email, the second you look at a text, now you're just thinking about that. You don't think about what your needs are. You don't think about what makes you happy. And it's like, great, you might make all this money. You might be successful, you might be doing good, but if you don't take, moments to yourself every single day to like you know focus on you you're gonna fucking go down a downward spiral and i did that for a while and i'm trying to you know spend that first hour at least for myself and it's been very like life-changing almost and it's yeah. been very good yeah that's good yeah. for me it's like for me it's the first hours of reading and the meditation but for me i'm very physical so yeah. the shaking off the morning rust is a really yeah. big part of my kind of thing so i'll work out and i'll do it yeah. and i'm like all right i've kind of worked out the morning demons in my yeah. head and now like you know how you're saying like you take time yourself. Now the first thing isn't, oh, some guy's demanding it for me because I'm some guy's demanding my policy. Yeah. It's not the first thing I'm reading. It's, no. uh, you know, you're loved by God, you know, love yeah. and light, you know, yeah. like, oh, well, this guy's just, you know, just trying to do a good job for his client. Let me yeah. talk to the judge or see if I can help him, you know. Yeah. Kind of makes me an overall better person for my relationship, for my, yeah. for my with my with my wife. Or it my, permeates. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everything. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's good. Um, and then discipline is a huge part of it too, right? There's, I've read like a couple of things online where it says it takes 21 days to make a habit, right? So don't get distressed people if you start a habit and you start doing something and it doesn't immediately click, right? You're gonna take a couple of weeks, your body has to get used to it, you mentally have to get used to it and then it becomes part of your routine. Um, I do like the discipline in the morning, the workout thing. I definitely wanna have a guest on here, potentially somebody who's like specializing in workouts. I wanna kinda of pick someone's brain about what's the best time to work out. Like, is it super early in the morning? Is it later on at night? Cause I've always been, I like to work out at the end of the day, right? When like I, I stop thinking about work so I can actually just like be in the workout. And that's like the time that's best for me is like usually 536. But other times it, for people it's early in the morning. So I'm interested in finding that out. For you, I know you've done both. Which one do you like better? I like the morning one because it kind of starts my day off with a, you know, you kind of get the dopamine going and serotonin. Yeah. It kind of gets everything, you get the sweat, I kind of get all the neck, like for me, I kind of wake up grumpy, you know, <laughs> like, so that's why I do all this stuff to change my mood. But like, so I prefer the morning, but I used to work out at nights. And, yeah. you know, for me, I also do like the intermittent fasting stuff. So it kind of really kicks up my metabolism before I eat my, my first meal. Got it. So that's why I like the mornings. Yeah. But I think it's for, for my body, really, it's more of an individual thing. Like it's more important that you actually work out than yeah. when you do it. But like the timing is also, I think it's more of a personal thing too. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So let's get to my favorite question that I like to ask people. So like I've discussed before, I think that it's not the successes that really define us, right? When you're going along and you're again, win after win after win, you're not really learning anything, right? You're just, you're staying stagnant. I mean, you yeah. might be growing like financially, but you as a person, you're not really learning anything. You learn from the make mistakes that you make. Yeah, for sure. Right? So I want to ask you, you know, what is the biggest mistake or biggest mistakes that you've made that have helped you end up on your path to where you are today, right? Like what have you learned from them and what have they really taught you? So for me, when I was younger, I would just say things and not do them. So like for me now, it's a big thing is if I say something, I do it. 
So following through with my word is like, because it not only affects me, but then when I'm trying to look like people look to me, I'm, I'm not credible when I can't follow through with my word. So for me, a big thing was, now I follow through with my word. If I say I do something, I almost like always try and do it because yeah. I know like for me, it, it's, 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 my, it's my word. So that's like one of the only yeah. things I really have in my life. And second thing is, uh, well, I guess there's two other things. For me, it was like, you know, like we're doing the Tony Robbins book. It's for yeah. me, I'm learning that there's always a way to improve. And before, yeah. like, you know, like it was just, oh, well, I'm done being a lawyer. I went past law school. Now there's nothing really else to learn. Right. Yeah. So for me now, I'm learning like there's always a way to improve, whether it's even just the way I, I'm emailing somebody yeah. or it's a way I'm reviewing the law or writing a letter or yeah. just the way, I, you know, there's always some area I can improve in. Yeah. And now I'm trying to constantly find a new way of improving. And then my final thing is that you do amazingly well that um, I'm, that I wish I did when I was like in law school is that, uh, that you network like crazy because you, you're only as good as the people around you. So yeah. for me, I didn't network as much when I was like an early lawyer, but now I'm like kind of doing the mixing and matching. Yeah. So for me, like one of the best quotes that kind of relates to that is, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go go together. So yeah. for me, like now I'm kind of doing that where it's like we can do way more together than by yeah. myself. So that's kind of those are the three things that are kind of my biggest downfalls that I think I'm I've, I've recognized that are improving my life now. Yeah, no, I, I agree with the networking thing. I mean, all I've learned in life when it comes to networking is every opportunity is a chance to network. You really never know who's going to be able to bring what to your life and who's going to really be able to offer something, right? I always ask questions. I like to know what people do for a living. I like to hear what people's specialties are because everybody does something for some company or they own their own companies and they really have something that they can share with you, right? Some people are, of course, going to have much more to share, but somebody always has something. And yeah. it's important to realize every time you go out or you do something and I, I've literally had people make fun of me and tell me you're way too social. You go out and you do too many things. You, you know, you go out to festivals and you do all these things so much. I'm like, you guys have no idea. Like the reason I have so much success in my life is because I'm always gun ho. I'm always trying to meet people and you never know who you're going to meet, right? Every chance encounter, or every conversation is a chance to meet a new best friend. It's a chance to meet somebody who can help you or somebody, you know, even though they might not be super extroverted like me, they might, but you sit down and you have a really good conversation with them. They could be one of the smartest people you've ever met. Mm -hmm. But if you're always just sitting at home and not really going out and socializing and never taking risks, like, don't get me wrong. Sometimes I'll go to a networking and be like, fuck, I don't know anybody here. Yeah. Like, and you just walk up and you start meeting people and you have to realize everybody has the same anxieties that you do. They feel stressed out about meeting new people and it's hard. But once you break the ice, they're all just human beings, right? Everybody wants to hang out. They want to get dinner. They want to have a drink. They want to chill. They want to dance. They want to live and they want to enjoy life. They want to be liked, you know? <laughs> they want to be liked. You just got to find some sort of commonality. And if you can do that, you can really create a huge network of individuals. And it's, and it's good. And, you know, too, I like one thing, you know, Ibrahim and I were in a book club together. And I highly recommend to anybody out there, like, like he was describing, you can always learn more, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody who thinks they know everything, I immediately, like, I don't dislike them, but I for sure actually dislike them. Mm -hmm. Like, you can always learn more about anything, even if you're an expert. Like, one of my favorite sayings is, I know nothing, because yeah. you can always learn more from others. You can always learn more from books. And there's, you know, it's funny. I was listening to a Hugh Jackman and Tim Ferriss podcast the other day, and Hugh Jackman was talking about, um, God, who's the guy that's the, Professor Xavier in, in X-Men, I forget his real name, but he said Charles. that he was, yeah, Charles, he, well, he's like real name. Uh, so he was freaking out with Hugh Jackman because he realized he's at a certain age now, he's like late 60s or something, and he realized I can only read this many books before I die, like, you know, uh, like mathematically. Yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. I started having that realization, even though I'm only 32 years old, right, and I'm young, but I figure if I'm reading like even one book every month or one book, like a certain amount of books every year, I started prioritizing and rearranging the books that I'm reading because I'm like, fuck, you know, like, what do I want to accomplish by these ages? Okay, I need to prioritize these books. What do I need to do by this point? And I need to prioritize these books. And you literally, like, even if I read books for fun, it's like, okay, I might have to push this back because my goals right now are to grow my business, to, you know, get word out on, on good information to people. And I need to focus on the, that type of book. And so it's really important to realize you have a finite amount of time and you want to make sure that you focus in on the things that matter to you when it matters to you. And so I've been trying to like have that kind of like guidance as to the books that we're like reading in our book club next and stuff, because I want stuff that pertains to all of us. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm going to rearrange my book order now too. Yeah, yeah. You got it, dude. It's like, you know, it's like 
realistically, most people are reading one book every one or two months, right? If you're like actually avid reader. And like, even if you do that, you just gotta realize you're reading only 12 a year. There is, I think, I don't, I don't I'm gonna say millions because I don't wanna be incorrect, but there's for sure hundreds of thousands of books out there, at least thousands of books. It's probably millions of books. And so <laughs> there's probably millions of books. And so if you have a specific niche, like, you know, I understand why it's like people don't say jack, be a jack of all trades. Like you can have interests in other things, but you really got to see what you're going to spend time because what it comes down to is you have a certain amount of hours every day. If you're going to watch Netflix for four, you can't read. Yeah. So like, that's it. You've taken your time to watch Netflix for four hours. So you got to divvy up your time correctly. And if you're divvying up your time correctly, you can every day you can read, you can watch Netflix, you can work, you can do all the things. Everybody's given the same amount of time every gosh damn day. But you know, just it depends how you spend it or waste it. It's like you got to kind of weigh the costs and balances there. That's true, yeah. Yeah. So, look, I've really had a great time having you here, my friend. I think this went great. We have a lot of great pieces. Um, thank you, our beautiful listeners, for chiming in. We really appreciate you. We appreciate you coming in here. I hope that you got some great value. Remember, don't drink and drive. Seriously, if you need an Uber or Lyft, you can reach out to me. Send me a message on Facebook or wherever. I will send you a Lyft or an Uber. And just stay safe out there. We love all of you. God bless, and have a wonderful day. This is the Nasty Truth Podcast. Time it out. Nasty.